Great. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and um, kick us off here today. Um, welcome. SIFSTAR is so pleased to be hosting this webinar today. Um, the purpose of this webinar is really to discuss how cities can be more resilient in times of crisis and partner with innovative technologies to accomplish their goals. Um, my name is Sarah Kerner. I'm the co-founder and chief strategy officer of SIFSTART. Um, a quick intro to SIFSTART. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, Anthony. Um, so SIFSTART's a nonprofit. We're focused on creating an honest and inclusive ecosystem of impactful technology startups that serve state and local governments and their communities. Primarily, we do this through our two-year startup accelerator program and also by working directly with governments on challenge-based pilot programs. Um, SIFSTART also recently launched an inclusive GovTech ecosystem task force and we'll be launching a healthcare-focused cohort early next year. I'd also like to quickly introduce the speakers that you'll be hearing from today. Dr. Jonathan Reichenthal is the former Chief Information Officer for the City of Palo Alto and a multiple award-winning technology leader whose 30-year career spanned both the private and public sectors. Jonathan is recognized as a global thought leader on a number of emerging trends and is an adjunct professor at several universities. And as you'll hear about today, he is a published author having most recently released The Smart Cities for Dummies. Our other speaker is Dr. Peter Pernajad. He currently leads Oracle's global public sector, state and local industry strategy team. Peter has over 20 years of local government experience in public administration, including the role of assistant city manager for the city of Napa and the development services director for the city of Palo Alto. His passion for advancing GovTech along with his local government insights has led to his publishing of a variety of articles and speaking on a number of panel panels. I'd also like to take a chance to thank our sponsor for today, um, Apex IT. Um, they are an cons IT consultancy that helps create solutions for areas such as customer experience, human capital management, and master data management. They're here on today's webinar, um, and I believe they'll be circulating their contact information um, in the chat and are um, you know, interested in following up with you at the end of this webinar. You'll also hear more about the great work that they're doing in this space during the conversation today. Um, and before we dive into the conversation, just a, a couple housekeeping items. Um, there will be a book giveaway for 10 attendees today. Um, a few of them will be based on audience participation, so please uh, feel free to chat or ask questions at the end of this, um, and then the others will be randomly selected. Um, again, we would love it if you participated throughout the conversation by chatting in your questions, and we'll certainly leave time at the end uh, to take your questions as well. Um, we'd love to have everyone have their cameras on um, and um, participate as much as, as you'd like. So I guess at this point, we'll um, go ahead and take down the slides and um, allow our two speakers to be on the screen. Perfect. Wonderful. So hi, Peter and Jonathan. Thanks for being here today. Hi, Sarah. Glad to be here. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having uh, me. Of course. Believe it or not, Peter's background is real. Um, <laughs> so let's see here. Um, I, I guess the first question I want to ask you all is, you know, we're talking a lot about urban innovation right now, um, but what do you two think is driving the current wave of urban innovation? Maybe we'll start with you, Jonathan. Yeah, we, you know, everyone says uh, we live in remarkable times. Every generation says that. But I do think that we live in remarkable times. You know, whether it is the uh, amount of innovation that's happening around the world, whether it's massive and rapid urbanization, uh, or if it's surprises like pandemics, right? Uh, so we do live in this, in this remarkable time. Um, one of the most clear characteristics of the world right now in 2020 is, is massive and rapid urbanization. Uh, we are moving into cities at a remarkable rate and we're building uh, you know, infrastructure at a remarkable rate. We build um, 
you know, infrastructure, city infrastructure to the scale of New York City, one Manhattan every month somewhere in the world, every month. And we'll do that, by the way, for the next 40 years. Um, so it's so many people living in cities now, moving into cities and cities becoming uh, our home. Um, you know, what we want is a better quality of life for everybody. We want our communities to be more inclusive, right? Everybody should have an opportunity to, to prosper. Uh, we want uh, our communities to have clean air and clean water. And we want people to have um, access to economic uh, opportunities. Uh, and we, we want good entertainment and, and we want parks and nice transportation. But we're far from that in, in many communities around the world, sadly. Um, so uh, w that desire and that, and, and that necessity to reach uh, you know, our, our vision for a better world and for better cities is, is driving remarkable change uh, in our communities. Uh, and, and we'll talk about a little bit of the examples uh, soon. Uh, but but it's, it's this moment, it's this moment in our time, and it'll go for many decades, where we have to bring new ideas to the table. We have to have much greater community participation. Um, and this is going to drive uh, innovation at scale and a whole new generation of solutions to support a better quality of life. Yeah, um, just to add on to that, Jonathan, that's a great point. And that trend has been going on for some time. Um, the remarkable thing that we're seeing in cities stepping up to this challenge is that as you see urbanization grow and 50% of the world's population will be in cities very soon, is that they have existing infrastructure that needs to keep up with that, with that transition over to urban areas. So that means not only their hard infrastructure, their roads, their utility systems, their power lines, uh, water lines, all of that hard infrastructure needs to keep up with increasing numbers. City staff don't increase at the same rate and numbers as population increases. So they have to do literally more with less or more with the same. Um, then you have the technology, those legacy systems that are needed to keep up with exceeding demands, exceeding populations and demands of those populations that don't wanna to have to come to cities. Then on top of that, you have something like COVID, which completely changes the dynamics. In local government, mostly the work that we do is face-to-face. -face. It's a high touch industry. And so when you go to a, a scenario where you can't be face-to-face, -face, whether it's in council meetings, whether it's um, at the front counter, uh, doing business, and you have to virtualize all of that work, governments more than ever have had to be agile and accelerate the pace at which they, they change. In the past, they would be able to have a little bit more time to respond, uh, but now it's like everything has to go from uh, in-person to virtual, and now we're seeing um, the future forcing us to rethink how government runs. In addition to responding to increased populations, we're thinking about virtualizing the entire experience, not only for staff, but also for our constituents. So it's definitely a trying time. And on top of that, you have a backdrop of reducing tax base. Cities that are dependent on sales tax are taking a big hit. Um, and so we're, we're having to, again, look to technology and more and more public leaders are looking to technology to answer some of these challenges that they're facing. Um, and it's really um, a great opportunity for the tech community to come together uh, and offer some solutions in that regard. So we can get more into where startups play a role in that. Wonderful, Peter. So I, you kind of already started answering the next question is, um, you know, where can we anticipate the biggest changes to our cities? I'm curious, Jonathan, if you have, um, you know, items to add to some of the top priorities Peter already mentioned. Yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about cities in, in many ways, apart from being, you know, uh, uh, big, complicated, you know, machines that are largely quite successful in elevating lots of people out of poverty. Um, the great thing is they, they, they are so diverse in the number of uh, things that they, services they provide and in the challenges that exist. So if you're a problem solver like myself or Peter, even you, Sarah, 
you know, uh, they're, they're uh, an amazing canvas of opportunity. Um, and and that'll, uh, that'll remain that way for a long time to come. I think uh, there could be a long list to this question in terms of what we can anticipate, but I have three things I'd like to share in, in, uh, specifically. Uh, and, and the first is the uh, is autonomous vehicles, the, the emergence of autonomous vehicles. Uh, I mean, this is just a big deal for all of us and how we'll get around. So just the idea of, you know, uh, 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 having on-demand transport that comes and picks us up and drops us off somewhere. I mean, that's pretty cool. And that'll be transformational in of itself. But I think the, what we've got to think about is what does that mean to how we, uh, how we design cities? You know, do, do we need traffic signals? Do we need lanes? Do we need parking spaces? You know, there's a whole lot of different opportunities that emerge when you start to uh, see that rapid transition. And I personally believe it's a personal opinion that we will, uh, accelerate the journey to uh, self-driving vehicles over the next uh, uh, few decades. Uh, the next area that I would uh, point out, uh, and it's very timely now because there's a lot of stories on this, is the, uh, is, is the soon to arrive uh, drone infrastructure, uh, both uh, terrestrial, those drones that are on the ground and drones in the air. Um, you know, today there's a few experimental sites. I mean, here in California, we experimented with uh, terrestrial drones, and even in Palo Alto and in Redwood City and around the world in, in the Netherlands and some other places. Um, drones in the sky have been tested too. Uh, there's, there's passenger drones, uh, a little experiment uh, going on, some work in, in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates um, and, and, a, and a couple of cities in China. Um, but it's the sort of autonomous delivery drones that I think are going to come in a big way. Um, this week, uh, Amazon was approved by the uh, Federal Aviation Authority here in the United States um, for delivery by, uh, by drone. So, um, you know, we, we had overnight delivery. We were pretty excited about that. Then we had same day delivery. We were pretty excited about that. Then we have one hour delivery. Uh, my drones, you know, deliver things now in 30 minutes or less. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable how we're, we're con continuing to squeeze the, the, the time out of that. Um, so drones will change the landscape, you know, uh, just in, in terms of support for the cities and, um, you know, the capabilities available to people. Finally, uh, and, and this is one that will touch us all uh, and, and is already doing it, is digitalization. You know, we, we talk a lot about digital transformation in the private sector uh, and it, uh, you know, it, it's changing the way we consume services and we deliver services. Uh, and it's you know changing the nature of businesses we've taken for a long granted for a long time. Uh, television, for example, you know, <laughs> so many of us have moved to uh, to just over the air TV, and um, uh, basically, uh, you know, Netflix has been a phenomenon, and there, and there continues to be more and more. Um, that digital transformation is now starting to trickle into uh, cities and local government in a big way. Um, and, and, and they'll show up in terms of uh, instead of going to a development center that, for example, Peter used to run as part of his portfolio, um, people will do much more from a smartphone. You know, they, they won't have to go to a, to a government building and request, uh, you know, fill out some paperwork and, uh, you know, get involved in too much bureaucracy. We're going to see a lot more digital tools for when you interact with government. Um, and uh, while it's happening already, it, it, we're about to see a, a snowball of that as, as of course, uh, more and more of us expect to have digital interactions. And this new normal uh, means we're, we're more inclined to want to access services remotely as well. So that's just three. I'm wondering, you know, uh, what Peter thinks about those or, or what he has in, on his mind. Yeah, I mean, you brought up the point, Sarah, that um, what has COVID or our current state of affairs, how has that affected the way governments respond to, to challenges? And, and what we've seen is that um, government agencies have to respond quickly. And so they need to partner with, their, with those vendors that can respond quickly to a whole new set of requirements and needs. Um, an example of that, uh, thanks to the uh, help of our gracious um, uh, host today, uh, Apex IT, uh, they, they walked into a situation in the city of Los Angeles. They were, the city was in a dire strait. Um, their population by mid-April 
only had 45% of the county with jobs. So they needed to do something quickly. Uh, the local government leaders knew that they needed to get money in the hands of the residents uh, to really pay for their livelihood. They were literally uh, stalled and they, they didn't have access to money. Uh, so Mayor Garcetti um, and his local leaders came up with an innovative solution. And using the mayor's fund, uh, they basically solicited donations on top of that to provide assistance in the form of prepaid debt cards uh, to low-income residents in the city. So Oracle, uh, working in partnership with MasterCard, uh, clearly Apex IT taking a, a big part of that um, in partnership with Accelerator for America. Again, a great place where nonprofits come into these wicked problems, uh, delivered a solution in literally three weeks. So they basically distributed $36 million of direct financial assistance in the form of these uh, debit cards, these prepaid cash cards, 37,800 of these prepaid cash cards were distributed to over 120,000 people in the city of Los Angeles. That's an amazing amount of money that was distributed very quickly and getting them in the hands of the people that needed the most. But it wasn't just provided willy-nilly to everybody that could receive them. They actually went through a very diligent application process to weed out those that, um, that that didn't versus the ones that truly needed that, that money. 76% of the funds went to people making less than $17,000 a year. I mean, this is the most needing of people. In fact, 100% of the funds went to people making less than 60,000. I mean, the Bay Area is expensive, but Los Angeles is not a cheap place to live. To think that there's people out there living on $17,000 a year really boggles the mind. And, and governments now more than ever need to respond to this need in literally real time. And so being able to drop everything and come up with a plan that not only identifies your most vulnerable, but is able to give them assistance quickly and effectively. That's what we're seeing gov uh, technology uh, needing to roll up their sleeves and work with local government agencies to try to uh, get, get to the heart of the problem and, and get, get assistance quickly. Great example. Yeah, that is. I, um... I guess on that note, you know, we spoke a good amount about um, the future trends of smart cities, but I'm curious, Jonathan, too, if um, you have any thoughts around what smart cities uh, work is happening right now or what cities are pri prioritizing right now to um, increase their resiliency. Yeah, that suddenly became a big topic, right? Uh, we, we used to talk about it a lot, but we, we maybe didn't put it into our top three or top two priorities in cities. Uh, well, that day is over. Uh, resiliency now is in the, in the top three for, for, for sure. Um, you know, it might be worth just uh, me giving my quick uh, definition. Uh, you know, resilience is about the ability to bounce back, right? The ability to bounce back when something happens. Um, and, and not only to bounce back, but often to bounce back better, right? Um, and there's sort of two types of city events that are the two categories of, of resiliency in cities that, that we should mention. Um, one is uh, what you might call chronic stress. <laughs> and, and chronic stress really is those long-term issues that really uh, haunt and, and keep cities back. Things like unemployment, homelessness. Um, you know, economic challenges, uh, maybe crime, um, you know, th those infrastructure decay, those are sort of chronic stresses. Um, and, you know, over time, they, they, they wear on a city and they're, they're, they're big challenges. The second category is acute stress. Acute stresses are things that happen suddenly, right? Uh, an earthquake, you know, a, a hurricane, um, a disease, a pandemic, right? Um, and, and, and these are happening with more frequency. Interestingly, our climate emergency falls into both categories, right? Our climate emergency is about um, a chronic stress because you have cities like Miami where, uh, where flooding used to be rare, now is uh, pretty common, right? Uh, Venice, you know, a, a city that uh, again, uh, flooding happened during, you know, particular times of the year, but now it's almost 365. So we're seeing the effects of that are, and then if you look at the sort of acute issues, 
Um, it's things like, um, uh, it, it, it's like these uh, fires we're having here in California uh, and uh, more hurricanes in the, in the Atlantic coming up uh, to the Gulf Coast of the United States. Um, so uh, it, it, it is a, a, a subject that city leaders have now realized they have to make, a, uh, make an absolute uh, priority. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a very big topic, but uh, just to sort of share uh, a couple of thoughts on, on what cities are doing and thinking about. Um, there's some great work that was done by the uh, Rockefeller Foundation. It's called a City Resilience Framework, the CRF. And it's free online. It's a resource for city leaders and, and people interested in this topic. Um, and they talk about sort of characteristics of, of resilient systems for cities. Uh, and, and I just want to share, uh, there's seven, and maybe I'll just share uh, three. And, and, and if you have an interest in this, others can, can look it up. Um, but it talks about a, a city should be informed um, by the past and the future. And I think that's, that, that's a good thought. You know, uh, definitely consider the experiences of your city and other cities in how you think about uh, what you need to do today. And then, of course, you've got to do this sort of predictive work and prob probability work to anticipate uh, issues of the future. Um, inclusiveness. And I, I, you know, I know Peter is passionate. I know you, Sarah, you're passionate about this topic. Inclusiveness even applies to resiliency. We have to include a broad group of stakeholders in the discussion about resiliency. And that means startups. That means the big firms like Oracle and, and uh, great companies like Apex IT, they need to be in the resilience topic um, with, with cities. Um, integration, right? Integrating systems and organizations. Uh, very often with these big topics, you have to have regional efforts. It's not sufficient just to have uh, one city tackle something. You know, something like climate change, it, 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 you know, if just one city in a country did lots of work, it, it would it would be, uh, you know, wouldn't be as effective as if if uh, all the major cities in a country participated. You know, so you've got to have uh, much more uh, integration of systems and 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 organizations. And and the last one I wanted to point out, uh, I did more than three, but one more is when we build things, which we do all the time, we should bake and we have to bake resiliency into the design. Right. So when we build roads or buildings or bridges or new water systems or, you know, uh, install fiber, whatever it is we're doing in the city, we have to have the resilience topic on the table uh, and it has to be baked into everything we do. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. You know, to that point, uh, it used to be that sustainability was a topic that was considered after you considered everything else, you know, right. so. Uh, back in my planning days, you know, you'd go through your environmental impact report and then you'd think about sustainability or you'd think about resilience. Um, now it's part and parcel to everything you think of. You can't just have a chief sustainability officer like we used to have in, in Palo Alto. Our good friend, Gil Friend, was, uh, was in that position. And one of his biggest challenges was to get everybody to think about the need for resilience and sustainability and everything that they did. Um, so the same thing uh, when we're when we're talking today about resilience and we're talking about uh, being a government that that can withstand whether it's uh, a short term or more of a systemic long term impact. We need to be thinking in terms of how can we respond and then snap forward in response to these to these challenges. Whether we're talking about climate change, which is a, a continued progression of challenges, or we're talking about a hurricane. Um, city of Jacksonville uh, last year was hit by Hurricane Dorian. They immediately had to go to, an, to a virtual model. Uh, and thanks to some work that we did with them, they had the, the technology in place to be able to go to a virtual model. And those 311 dispatch officers were able to work from home literally within an hour of, of uh, having a, a cloud solution. And again, not, not to press on that one technology, but that's really a game changer here when you're talking about being resilient, um, going from legacy databases and legacy systems that sit on your premise to a cloud solution that is accessible anywhere, is more secure, is proven to be more uh, 
resilient, um, that seems like a no-brainer. But, but again, it takes us a while to get there. And government agencies are risk averse. And so it takes them longer. But now in the face of COVID, uh, those cities that were able to deploy uh, solutions or um, be able to get their workforce working because they had a online solution, a, a cloud-based solution, they were more resilient. And the example of Oklahoma, for example, um, they went from their, their IT department had normal support needs. And so they would reach out to about 500 support calls a month. Well, all of a sudden they got hit by COVID and Jerry Moore, their CIO, uh, was dealing with 1,500 calls per day. So imagine trying to scale to that capacity and give your employees the ability to provide help desk when you've got being flooded with calls. There's not enough call, call phones to take that many calls. So they immediately had to work with us to put together a, a chatbot solution that would able to quickly screen calls, give people the information they need, give them the self-help that they need um, so they can deal with those 30,000 state employees calling, blowing up their phone lines, trying to get their, their help desk issues resolved. Um, and these are the type of situations that we're seeing governments having to respond quickly to. You can't ramp up over the period of a month or three months to get that kind of uh, effectiveness in place. You need to literally respond on the dime. And so we're seeing a lot of of situations where cities are calling us and asking us to step up and, and really pull a college style all nighter for three weeks to try to get something running. Uh, another example of that is Tarrant County, Texas. Um, so with the help of uh, Accenture, Adobe, Splunk, a uh, few others, um, Rob Lloyd, the CIO for San Jose assembled a team and quickly tried to think through how do we build a more resilient testing solution so that we can actually help cities not only determine uh, your eligibility to get a COVID-19 test based on the CDC criteria, uh, manage test scheduling with a variety of testing facilities out there, which ones have the capacity to take your, take your appointment and then take that test and then provide secure storage to, in, to, to house all that information that comes from the tests and then use insights to identify where we're seeing trends and hotspots, et cetera. So Oracle partnered with them to try to develop something and that literally took about a month to go from concept to implementation. And it's, it's challenging for everybody, but then these challenges are coming up one after the other. And it seems like, um, cities are still trying to grapple with, you know, what's the next wave that's going to hit them. And um, it, it, it just, it really is pressing not only large companies, but even the smaller ones, Sarah, these startups that are, that are jumping into action and jumping in with both feet to see how they can help. And that's the, the most encouraging part of this is that I've never seen so many people willing to lend a hand, try to come to a solution. And you're seeing these startups as you know, Sarah, come from literally all over the world. Some of the, uh, some of the, the people in this cohort, the startups have just been amazing. Their ideas, their innovation, their willingness to, to really grapple challenging and wicked problems has been really encouraging. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of things. that You made such amazing points there, Peter. Uh, I, I really wanted to double down on, on, the, on the point about cloud computing. Uh, you, you know, I, I started back with the uh, city of Palo Alto when I was there back in 2011. And although it's only nine years ago, uh, you know, cloud computing was not uh, yet being embraced by the public sector, uh, at least not in a, in a substantial uh, big way. Um, and I remember having lots of discussions with uh, my, my peers in different cities all over the country and in fact in the world and cloud was was not a priority the the focus had been as it had always been for on-premises uh, solutions um, but we've seen through this decade uh, a gradual migration of uh, city solutions from on-premises uh, where there still remains a lot to more of a cloud um, provisioning and, and suddenly, you know, if, you, if we had a graph, you'd see the steady progress. And then in 2020, you'd see this massive spike as cities realized, uh, you know what, uh, we, we can't be tethered to this expensive, you know, on-premises old architecture. We need to 
rapidly move uh, to cloud. Um, so it's one of the greatest opportunities ever is for all types of organizations, including Oracle and Apex and all the uh, Apex IT, all the uh, start, many of the startups that uh, come into CIF start uh, in your organization, Sarah, uh, to uh, now have an opportunity to, to provide those cloud services to cities, to make them uh, survive through something like a significant pandemic or uh, the earthquake that will invariably come. Um, and, and so my point being first that this is a big deal, it's a big opportunity, but second, uh, and, and sort of Peter was, uh, was talking about this and I wanted to really emphasize because I, I thought it was such a great point is um, we need more. We need more ideas. You know, uh, when I was sitting on the other side of the table as a buyer um, in, in a city for IT solutions, uh, we, we, we need luck. We had lots of things we needed, library systems and, and upgrades to our permitting systems and uh, stuff to support our traffic signals and our public safety. Um, and, the, and the group of providers often was small and it wasn't as innovative as we would like it. Um, and some solutions were not being addressed. So there is this massive space, this massive white space for uh, what we like to call now GovTech or urban tech companies to, to either begin or to enter into uh, this marketplace. And, and it's, uh, it's a win-win all around because we need the solutions and those that provide them can uh, you know, create great companies. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And of course, um, all of us here at Sivstart, we see a lot of amazing innovative technology startups that want to meet the needs of state and local governments um, all the time. And, you know, if you go on our page, there's a whole section on how these startups pivoted to offer their solution uh, pro bono in a lot of cases to um, governments in the COVID era. And um, so I think that it is, you know, a budding industry with uh, a lot of room for, for more. I am curious though, you know, as two people that have worked in government, what you would suggest to governments as far as making it easier or more accessible for startups to work with governments. Um, I think a lot of times uh, people ask themselves, you know, what can startups do to be more involved in the government space, but I would actually flip that. And uh, I think the, the bigger question is what can governments do to uh, make that process um, less cumbersome for startups. Peter, you want to give it a go? Sure, sure. I'll take a stab. Um, no, there was a uh, there was a great article actually. Arik wrote yesterday. It was it couldn't have been more timely, right, Jonathan? So we, well, we co-wrote uh, it. We wrote it together. Friend of ours. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was a great article, by the way. Yeah, really spoke to this very point. You know, I mean, there is definitely things that governments can do. Um, I mean, just for for the easy one is procurement, right? I mean, that's always been a sticking point. Um, having, having the ability to provide a more flexible procurement uh, runway, you know, so that you can help define the problem. And that's been always the challenge. We're dealing with problems that we've never had to deal with before. And so how is it that you can write a re, uh, an RFP to address a solution that you don't even know because you have no idea what the problem is? Um, we're, we're constantly having to look for solutions for problems that we really haven't clearly defined yet. And that's, that's the first challenge. So we need more of a, uh, a partnership approach to um, responding to problems as opposed to more of the regimented, rigorous kind of uh, RFP process lays out. And, and it needs to be fair, it needs to be equitable, but at the same time, it needs to be flexible and responsive to a new world that's, uh, that's challenging us with um, in things that we've never seen before. When was the last time we had to deal with a pandemic? Um, the other things that cities can do, and um, our good friend, from, the CIO from Las Vegas, uh, has done an amazing job. Um, Michael Sherwood uh, set up an innovation uh, district to really pilot new technologies and give the vendors an opportunity to try out their wares in the real world. Oracle has a innovation lab that we're, we're working on and um, it already exists for our construction and engineering practice. We're expanding it, but it's to that same idea. How do we innovate around technology that, that needs to be put in practice and people need to see it. We need to bring customers in front of it. 
and uh, look at the latest lighting system that can also generate uh, a strong 5G signal and that can also be, you know, a, uh, a gunshot detector and Wi-Fi enabled, et cetera. So all these great technologies need to be put into practice. And there's, if there's something about government, it's that it's, it's not a controlled environment. You, you need to make sure that you're providing services to the complete range of people. And so if there's any advice I can give the vendors for a quick second is that you can't be targeted to one particular buyer. When you're talking about the government, understand that they're having to serve the entire population. They need to serve every walk of life. So we need to make sure that those devices or that software, the solutions can be put in every remote part of a city from urban to rural um, to dense to low population areas. Um, so really important that you, you think in broad terms when you're des developing uh, technology and, and government agencies need to give those vendors an opportunity to really try out and test. Um, and then the last thing is just an open mind. You know, government agencies, just even taking time out of your day to sit and talk to uh, vendors to, to give them a sense of where are your pain points. Um, Atlas did a, a great article. They did a great study in partnership with ELGL uh, that I would highly recommend people to download and view. I'll drop a link into this chat that really talks about through, um, they did a, 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 a great survey of cities to see where are your pain points. And it's amazing the difference between where you saw pain points six months ago versus where you saw pain points today. Like if you'd asked six months ago, where are your priorities related to traffic? It would have been extremely high. You ask them today, you can imagine the answer. Nobody's driving anywhere. So traffic is not an issue. It'll be another issue in a year from now, but for right now, that's a secondary problem. So right now, if vendors are going after traffic solutions, well, you're not gonna get, you know, priority because right now government agencies are dealing with, you know, how do we provide remote work, which is, wasn't an issue six months ago. So that's why um, we just need to be flexible all around. I said yeah, it back to you, Jonathan. Yeah, no, I love, I love your examples there, Peter. Really, really, uh, I, I would say you kind of hit some of the top points. Uh, I, I wanted to share a quick little story that kind of adds to this. Uh, uh, Peter will, will know the characters involved with the people. Um, but, but many years ago, you know, uh, probably within two or three years of me joining the city of Palo Alto, you know, it was, was late in the evening and uh, I got a phone call um, and uh, a lovely gentleman on the other side of the phone said, hey, I'm calling from a startup. I have this idea. I said, well, tell me about it. So he told me about the idea. And I think it was about 7 p.m. in the evening. And the guy who would be the best customer for what they were pitching was Peter. So I, um, I said, just a moment, please. And, and I put him on hold. And then I called over to Peter's office. He was in a building, you know, across the street from me. And of course, <laughs> it was not uncommon for Peter and I to be working late. He picks up the phone at, you know, 7 p.m. or 7.30. And I said, hey, I got this sort of great entrepreneur on the other line. Would you be interested in talking? And Peter said, yes. So I connected them both. And, and within a few you know, weeks, they were talking about how they could collaborate on something. And so the, the lesson from this is a couple of things. When I, when I talked to the, uh, the entrepreneur himself, Kieran is his name, uh, you know, many, uh, maybe a year or two later, and we sort of debriefed in it. He said, you know, when he first, uh, and he came, from an, he came from Ireland and he was uh, trying to sell his product in the United States. When he, uh, when he called uh, around different CIOs and different cities, uh, nobody answered the phone. He never got a single uh, person who actually picked up the phone. Uh, when he sent emails to CIOs and CDOs of cities, he rarely got a response. But when he called me, I picked up and I listened and I immediately connected to Peter and Peter listened and immediately engaged. And he said that was such a refreshing and remarkable government experience for him. And, and eventually that company went on to do good things. Um, governments need to open the door. And, and this was really a big quality of, you know, how both Peter and I, uh, you know, managed our respective areas at the city of Palo Alto is we had an open door policy. We listened, you know, some of the ideas didn't go anywhere. And sometimes uh, it was just a conversation, but often it led to something. So governments have to make it um, easier for the startup community to listen. 
um, and, and, and to be heard, I should say, uh, for the startup community to be heard. I think that's really key. The, la the, the next thing, just a quick, quick suggestion, and it ties in very nicely with the Vegas uh, example of their innovation district, which is, which is quite remarkable, is this idea of a living lab, a living lab. Um, this is where you know, government chooses a, a particular area. It can be inside a building or very often it's a sort of a, a, a block or, or a little neighborhood. And they dedicate that area for testing things. And, you know, a lot of the time what the startup company wants is the opportunity to test their idea in a, in a real life environment. Um, and uh, they're just waiting for a city just to give the permission to do that. And more and more cities are developing these living labs to allow that. It's great for the startup community, uh, great learnings, great learnings for the city too. But it even goes further. It says, you know, hey, this works. This should be definitely part of our decision making as we think about who we're going we're gonna to procure at the end of the day. Um, so I think building these and dedicating areas to sort of a living lab uh, can complement, um, uh, you know, your city and create much greater opportunities for uh, startups. Can I add one more thing to that, Sarah? You know, so just the, the talk of, of startups just really sparked my uh, thinking for a second. And, and, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the role that nonprofits play in this. You know, um, it is absolutely so important that we have organizations like CivStart and Alliance for Innovation um, and others that, that are really able to be the glue to bring it all together. You know, if it wasn't for organizations that really helped not only nurture these startups, but also nurture local governments. I mean, in the case of Alliance for Innovation, they're literally nurturing local governments to help them understand how to be innovative, how to be open-minded and, and what does innovation look like? You know, a lot of these government agencies are really leery about being the first ones out of the gate and they need a network of other government agencies that can go in together and start to bat around ideas and have a, a safe and open environment where they can talk about what does innovation in policing look like? What, is it, what does it look like to, um, to consider social justice in a safe forum where we could talk about defunding the police, what does that really mean? And, and what are we funding if we're defending something else? So um, for those public agencies that are on this call, I would really encourage you to look for those organizations that you can be part of uh, that really foster that open collaborative environment where you can network with other peers that are like-minded and invite those startups and those companies that are able to provide the leading edge technologies and the leading edge thought leadership in the areas of policing or whether it's government technology, civic technology, but the nonprofit portion of this equation is so very vital because up until now, governments used to talk to other governments to, to solve problems, but we've come to realize that this new world requires a really collaborative governance, a kind of governance that requires you to reach out to the academic sector, the nonprofit sector, as well as the public and private sector to solve these problems. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Peter. Um, something CIFSTORT's been spending a lot of time on this year is um, a program with the National League of Cities and the Kauffman Foundation where uh, we're kind of acting as pseudo consultants to cities um, and helping them identify problem statements and then going out and finding good startup solutions that really meet those needs and doing a kind of challenge-based um, you know, pilot program with them. And I think um, you know, it's been helpful to the cities that were able to de-risk those startup solutions for them um, since they don't really have the capacity to do that. And I think um, you also mentioned capacity earlier, Peter, and I think one last question I wanna ask before um, I pivot to doing some of the audience questions is, um, you know, a lot of, a, a big issue I hear from, you know, pretty much every government right now is um, a lack of funding when it comes to, procuring new solutions. And I, I wonder, you know, how you see this impacting the future of smart cities or maybe ideas you have for governments um, to get around that. I certainly think a lot of times startup solutions are more affordable, but um, that is just one, one piece of it. I'll, I'll take that. You want me you to want... go first, Jonathan? You want to take it? Go ahead. Sure, sure. 
Uh, very happy to. Uh, yes, look, this, 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 uh, this question is top of mind for, for everyone, for the sellers and for the buyers. Um, uh, it, one thing we need to recognize is we are going through a, a, a temporary situation, right? Uh, now, it could be extended, uh, as in this could last a while, um, but we, we will recover. The, the pandemic will, will subside and eventually uh, we'll get we'll get on top of it and things will uh you know whatever that new normal looks like we'll we'll get back to it um so i'm i'm, I'm an optimist you know we, we we'll get through this um that said uh i do think that generally even in the absence of the pandemic uh we need to think about uh how solutions get done in cities uh, you've got the traditional model of uh vendor comes in city buys the product everyone's happy right that's the sort of a traditional model uh, but increasingly, we're exploring other ways of delivering. Number one, uh, partnerships, right? And there are so many different types of partnerships. And P3s are public-private partnerships, something Peter has uh, researched and done a lot of work on, uh, particularly as part of his, uh, his uh, PhD work. Um, so, you know, let's collaborate. Let's work together in, in, in solving things. Let's, uh, you know, have the private sector bring to the table what they do well, how the public sector bring to the table what they do well, and go to market, if you like, to use a private sector term, together, right? Um, the other thing I would say is uh, more so than ever before, and I say this a little bit cautiously, but I think you'll get the point, uh, startups and tech companies can deploy solutions independently uh, of, of City Hall. They shouldn't do, you know, it behind their back, you know, I always think that collaboration and talking and, and, you know, getting permission, doing all the right things uh, is, is valuable, but, you know, and this is a cliche, but Uber and Lyft and the other and Grab and the other, uh, you know, on-demand transportation services, they have changed how we get around cities, right? But it wasn't a government program and it wasn't a collaboration with government, right? A couple of guys here in San Francisco had a great idea and they pushed forward. Um, they hit some blocks as you know, bureaucracy issues at some cities. For the most part, they built a you know, $50 billion business that has transformed transportation in many cities uh, in the world. So I think there, we, we, we have the ability to deploy solutions um, you know, with maybe the uh, tacit agreement of, the, of City Hall, but not necessarily with needing uh, uh, money uh, from City Hall. Uh, mindful of time, I'm going to stop there and, and maybe get some of Peter's ideas too. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, you know, I, th I think with respect to kind of um, the whole partnership idea, you know, I, I, I kind of go back to um, government agencies are spending money and they're going to continue to spend money. It's not like the pandemic has hit and government agencies don't have budgets. They, they have budgets. The question is, what are you spending your money on? And are you spending it on the right things? So I think what, what we've come to realize is that more than ever, you need to demonstrate an ROI. You need to demonstrate to a government agency that, listen, you're spending money on X. If you could take that money and spend it on Y and free up X and reduce the amount of time and labor reduce the amount of time in duplications, reduce the amount of time in paperwork, in unnecessary tasks that could be automated using the help of AI and machine learning. If you could think about that in long term, which is the beauty of government, they don't think in quarters. They think in long term. So if there's a five-year payback, that's something that might get their attention. And it's, it's, it's something akin to getting solar panels on your roof, you know, in a five year span of time, those solar panels are going to pay for themselves. And pretty soon they're going to be a revenue source for you. So it's really important that if you're a technology company uh, that's coming into the public sector today, more than ever, you need to demonstrate value. You need to demonstrate long-term value and a, and a demonstrated ROI by reducing the amount of work that staff needs to do and increasing their capabilities. I mean, put yourself in the shoes of a public agency right now. They're not thinking about new services. They're thinking about what services are we gonna cut? So if you go to an agency and say, hey, we can help you do X better, 
the first thing that they're going to think of is that that's going to come at the expense of doing why less. And we need to go in there and say, hey, you can continue to provide all the services you provided, but we're going to give you a new platform, a new way of providing those services that are going to be cheaper, faster, less expensive, using less staff resources. And the challenge that I think is going to face startups today is that it has to be integrated. In the past, and Jonathan knows this, we had so many applications in Palo Alto that were all running disparate, that were all uh, disconnected and creating silos of their own. It was almost you know, a short-term gain for a long-term loss. And, and today, government agencies are less responsive to that. They want integration. They, they understand that they can't just kick the can down the road. They need to be able to solve the problems today without causing problems for tomorrow. So uh, just we need to be mindful and it's not enough to just have a quick solution. We need to be thinking about the integration and the long-term impacts and demonstrate that ROI so that government agencies can spend the money in the right places. Yeah, that, that's great. I think that's very true. Um, well, with our final five minutes here, I wanna pivot to some of the good questions we've gotten from the audience. Um, so the first one I see, can you talk a bit about regional coordination? So I know, I think Jonathan, you brought this up earlier. Um, if you have a range of small, medium, large sized governments trying to implement smart city programs individually, um, who should kind of take up the mantle and coordinate these efforts across the region? Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll try to give, because there's a few questions, we'll try to give some short answers here. Um, there's lots of great examples across the United States of regional efforts now. I, I'm really impressed. Uh, about the efforts in, in the Colorado area, um, uh, in particular as one, um, and, and some other areas uh, across the world, in fact. Uh, you know, we have to do, we have to approach regional issues like climate change and transportation um, together, uh, collectively. Um, and sometimes it'll require a sort of an independent association uh, or a temporary alliance between mayors who sort of sign an agreement to do something together. Um, uh, it, it's it, it, the it, it's very worthwhile, and there's some great examples. The one of the th areas that uh, could tie in with many of the topics we talked about today is the ability to uh, cooperate on purchasing. Um, so uh, you know, if if um, it, with, with with temporary temporarily less funds, or at least uh, the inability to do everything we want to do, um, you know, if if a regional area says, "Hey, we all want to purchase the following," or you know, we need extra licenses. Um, there is the ability to, to tie together um, the purchase agreements of several communities. Um, just needs somebody to step up. It needs a leader to step up and make it happen. Yeah, I think um, that's, a, that's a great point. You bring up regional issues. And I think now more than ever, ever regional government agencies are going to start getting more attention. Um, think about COGS, Council of Governments. One that comes to mind is San Joaquin Council of Governments. So here you have an organization that represents cities throughout the county, as well as the county, as well as partnering agencies. These kinds of government agencies, more than ever, are being relied on and should be relied on to deal with regional issues. In their example, they deal with regional housing issues, regional climate issues, air quality, habitat, transportation, and it's those kind of challenges that can only be addressed through the help of these regional governments. In the case of SJ Cog, they had passed a, a Measure K, which brought in a half cent sales tax. They did such a great job in the time that was passed in 1990, they re-upped it in 2006 for another 30 years. That really demonstrates that that Cog in particular really was able to get the confidence of their constituents and the bodies, the elected bodies that serve on that board to gain another 30 year bond for even more transportation improvements because they've all realized that these aren't challenges that they can solve within the city limits. Transportation ac across you know, the valley in, in the sense of California uh, is something that comes, that can only be solved regionally. And I think, my, I think you're gonna see more of an emphasis on those on those government uh, units, those COGS and other metropolitan transportation organizations that uh, they're a compilation of government agencies that come together to solve some of these more complex and challenging regional problems. Great. Um, and I think it looks like we have time for one more question. The next question that I see um, is related to a lot of what 
we've been saying, you know, related to limited resources and governments banding together regionally, um, seeing as cities really across the world have often similar challenges and there are limited resources, um, is there an ability to um, have cities band together and leverage national or global efforts in identifying technology solutions? Yeah, a quick answer. Look, it's, it's hard to collaborate locally. <laughs> I just want to be candid. It's, it's hard to even uh, collaborate in a, in a sort of a, a localized regional area. So, you know, international collaboration is, is at the extreme end of hard. Um, not impossible. And there are many fantastic global organizations, whether it's uh, the United Nations um, or the, uh, something like the Smart Cities Council, who's a you know, private company trying to do coordination efforts. Um, what we can do, you know, at a very basic level is, is share, you know, share, share, share our, our the things we do well, you know, the things we don't do so well. Um, there's great platforms for that. Um, and of course there, there's outliers to this, but, but let's get the local stuff done really well and the regional stuff do, done well. And, and then, um, we can certainly try to tap into some international uh, opportunities. Right. Absolutely. Jonathan. You know, when I was doing my dissertation, did a lot of work on collaboration. And my best favorite quote was collaboration is like cottage cheese. It smells and it falls apart quickly. <laughs> it's very difficult. Collaboration, to your point, Jonathan, is very difficult to assemble and keep together. So it really needs to be used for targeted problems, transportation, air quality, habitat preservation. I mean, something that you can assemble a group of people, define the problem, exercise them some solutions, and then, and then go from there. So the one thing that I would recommend to your point, Jonathan, is those regional studies that offer you insight that you normally wouldn't get when you're just looking locally. So ESI Thought Labs uh, was an effort that Oracle uh, entered into that really provided some great thought leadership and insight about what government agencies are working, are dealing with globally in relation to smart cities. What are their priorities? What is the rate of return for investing in smart cities? And so that's really important information to have when you're thinking as a local agency, should I invest in this whole smart city thing? What does it really mean? So studies like that give you global context that give you the ability to take a step back and see what are areas like Singapore? What are the richest communities, the poorest communities? How are they dealing with smart cities? What are the elements of smart cities that are giving them the greatest uh, return on investment? I'll drop a link in the chat that'll give you more information about that study as well. Perfect. Well, we are, are at time. This has been a great conversation. So thank you so much, Peter and Jonathan. Thank you to everyone that attended today. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions, but I know Jonathan and Peter are happy to connect with you offline. Um, and this recording will also be available on uh, the CIF Start website. Um, and Jonathan will be selecting 10 folks to give his book too. So please keep an eye out from, for any follow-up from us on that front. And then of course, you can purchase a copy, I believe on Amazon, if that's correct, Jonathan. Definitely, definitely. And, and all over the world, I, I would uh, recommend people to go to uh, smartcitybook.com, smartcitybook.com. Perfect. Well, thank you again to both of you and for everyone's participation. And thank you again, Apex IT for, for sponsoring today. Take care. Thank you.